<laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to Beer and Broadband, episode six. Today, we're talking about public and private partnerships, what they are, how they work, and why it matters to communities across the country. But uh, before we get into it, let's meet our esteemed panel. Uh, so if we can run around the room and do a quick introduction. We'll start off with the host of Beer and Broadband, Mr. Brian Hollister. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, Brian Hollister, I am your host and sponsor of Beer and Broadband. And thank you all for participating. I'm the CEO of Bonfire Engineering and Construction. Uh, we're a turnkey services firm that helps develop broadband networks. Um, why we exist is we believe every American deserves affordable broadband, enabling economic growth and access to education and healthcare. Uh, Bonfire partners with customers, vendors, and even competitors to offer education, insight, and any kind of resources we can provide to help solve some of the hardest challenges for broadband. Uh, we do this, like I said, through our turnkey service offerings and um, you know, through superior planning, engineering, and, and construction services. So thank you all very much for being a part of today. We're going to have some fun. Uh, there's always a little bit of extra fun when we have when uh, Cerveza is involved. And uh, we're gonna be sharing our experiences with um, uh, the different private and public uh, partnerships that um, are out there. There's so many different models, there's so many different examples, uh, which is so exciting um, to helping to solve some of these broadband challenges. So today is all about sharing you know, our uh, perspectives and, and hopefully the audience gets uh, a lot of value from that uh, as they enter a, a new project. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> And Zach. All right. So I'm Zach Hubeck. I'm with uh, Wave LLC. We are a uh, distributor, technology dist distributor out of Aurora, Illinois, and we distribute broadband products. So everything from uh, LTE to microwave broadband, uh, traditional uh, licensed or unlicensed networks. Our customers are traditionally wireless internet service providers, uh, ISPs, uh, telcos, um, ILEX, CLEX, and uh, Really, we exist because um, we're the logistical arm of all of this uh, broadband, making sure products get there in a timely fashion. And we absolutely love and thrive on doing uh, value-added services as well. So if it's pre-sales, if it's uh, link planning, can I get uh, this much uh, bandwidth uh, from this water tower to this water tower? Uh, we love doing a lot of engineering around um, these networks and, and the technologies that we distribute. So. That's Wave in a nutshell. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. And the other gentleman, I would, I can't make any ball jokes, but uh, I will. So the other gentleman, Mr. <laughs> Brian Worthen. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian Worthen from Mammoth Networks. We're a wholesaler and operate a network uh, that spans multiple states. And we wholesale to WISPs and CLEX and municipalities, um, independent phone companies, small MSOs. And we also operate a traditional ISP in our home state of Wyoming and, and uh, Western Slope of Colorado. And so we're a, we're a builder. Uh, we're a partner in three public-private partnerships as well. And so we've got a, a vast range of experience. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And Mr. Elliott. Hey, everyone. Russ Elliott. I am the CEO of Nothing. I have nothing to sell. <laughs> I am the uh, broadband director for Washington State, and I will work for broadband grant funds. <laughs> Thank you for having me. That's a bumper sticker there. Absolutely. That is a bumper sticker. <laughs> last but not least, uh, Eric. Hey, I'm Eric Forch. I'm the broadband development manager for the uh, broadband office for the Idaho Department of Commerce. We're the economic development agency for the state of Idaho. So yeah, uh, here, here to bring broadband uh, to rural communities in, in Idaho. So fun, fun opportunity and, and thanks for having me. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, you guys obviously have a wealth of knowledge. So let's get into it. Um, obviously the discussion topic today is public-private partnerships. We know that a lot of uh, communities, governments, they do see broadband as essential infrastructure, whether it be wireless, fiber, uh, whatever you know, the, the infrastructure is to get there. They know that that's gonna support economic development, education, healthcare, um, you know, digital equity, all these things. The elephant in the room, of course, though, is how do you make that happen? And the topic of, you know, public-private partnerships is obviously in the news a lot. Um, the really the big question is, you know, what 
are the different types of public uh, or private and public and private partnerships. Yeah, I think, you know, when we think about that, Nick, there's, there's probably three foundations to build on. And of course, so, so much, so many additional layers to that, but I think of, you know, private investment and public facilitation. Uh, I think of private execution and, and public funding. I think of, um, you know, more of a, a shared investment um, uh, and operational risk, right? So I, I think there's probably a lot of different models that, you know, are, are within each one of those. And, you know, I think with today's, you know, group here, um, it'd be good to kind of peel back the onion on some of these as uh, some of the teams had uh, experience with, with, you know, many different variations of this. So I guess maybe we should just kind of maybe hit each one of these, um, you know, and think about, cause you know, Nick and I, we were talking earlier and, you know, thinking about private investment and public facilitation, you know, what would be interesting is what, what, what are you guys seeing where you're seeing private investment come in, but what, 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 what have you seen as, as positive examples of how the public is helping to facilitate, right, that, that, um, that investment, right? What are they doing to try and encourage, you know, that, that private sector to come in and invest in, 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 into that, their particular, you know, town or municipality? Russ, you, why don't we kick it off with you? Yeah, I mean, a couple of thoughts right away to my, you know, come to mind. Here in Washington State, we've got things called public utility districts. And our public utility districts are similar to rural electric cooperatives, just a little bit different and, and, here you see the public utility districts really building out infrastructure, primarily open access infrastructure. However, here we are in legislative session and guess what bills hit, in the, hit the floor? Hey, we want retail authority, not just to be wholesale players, right? So it becomes kind of an interesting conversation. But here, public infrastructure, we've got three counties in the middle uh, of, our, of our state that are about 75, 80% built out fiber to the home, all in the backs of the public utility districts infrastructure where they allow private providers to come in and provide service on that infrastructure. So the private doesn't have to invest in the, uh, in the capital up front. They just come in and, and partake on the infrastructure that's on the back end. And uh, we're seeing very good success here in some areas. You know, I've, uh, there, uh, Grant County here, we've got, uh, I think it's 17 providers that compete on that infrastructure for the, the premise-based uh, uh, opportunities. So, uh, you know, it, it can work, it can work really well. The challenge becomes, right? As we start to get into that last mile, the challenge becomes uh, that public infrastructure in areas that are already built, you know, that, you know, and, and it's hard for, it's hard for a network to pass by that, that rich area, you know, and just focus on those, on those scraps out in the, out in the, uh, out in the ancillary, ancillary areas of the, of the region. So, so, you know, it becomes that real, it's that real, uh, tentative area that you, you dance in. And so we're, we're in it right now. I mean, we've got a big bill right now that's, that's saying uh, public utility districts should have retail authority, blanket retail authority, no consideration for anything, just go. And obviously um, I have a problem with that as a past provider. And I think the privates will say, you know, that's, that's a hard one for me because, you know, I've got a lot of investment here and I've taken risk and I've, I've gone out of, of beyond, you know, over the tips of my skis on some of these investments because I believe that, that I'm gonna have the integrity of that, of that business without unfair competition. So it's, a, it's an interesting game, um, but uh, we are seeing some good success here in that wholesale area. With the first example, Russ, you, you talked about, what was that? Was that Grant that you said? Grant County, yeah. Grant County, and you, wow, you've got a lot of ISPs partnering. So, so what, on that model, is that kind of an open access model? Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. Yeah. Got it, and, and are the ISPs coming in and, and just simply leasing fibers? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So the challenge is really owning the fiber, um, probably locating, maintaining it, but they're not an ISP. They're not a competitive, you know, threat. That's so, and, so I think and that's I'll tell you, you know, Brian, I had, a, I had a really good conversation with him today because one of the, uh, the, the, the representatives that's come forward with this retail bill, here, here's the big challenge, right? The challenge is you've got PUDs that operate in areas or rural electric cooperatives that operate in areas where there's incumbents that are not going to build out just don't have incentive to build out, will not build out. Wyoming, we had our big incumbent there walk away from its carrier of last resort responsibility, right? So you have that going on. You know, there, I say, Katie, bar the doors, let these guys go, you know, retail authority all day long, right? But but in areas where you've got, you know, competition, it's, it's uh, you know, we got to honor some of that private investment. So here, you know, that Grant County PUD actually came in uh, essentially kind of opposed to the retail bill saying, look, that's going to screw up what we have going on here. We've got a good thing going on. 
you know, so it kind of threw a grenade in the, in the cornflakes for the, for the representative today. And, you know, it's all, it's all happening as we speak. So good time to have this conversation. Yeah, no, I find that so interesting because it's like, wait, that that's a great, you know, what I would say success of private and, and, and public coming together where, where it sounds like both, both sides are winning, right? right? And then ultimately the constituents are obviously winning, you know, most of all, which is so important. And I think when we think about private and public relationships, you know, thinking about where, where, where this new legislative bill is going mm -hmm. is super interesting because um, I get it in some aspects, but I also get the, the, how a lot of the, the private ISPs are really going to be turned off that the state might be turning against them. Yeah, right? we, we, we have to add some language in there, right? There's got to be some language around served, unserved, uh, and that's going to be the, the, the play here that's going to probably blow this thing up. Uh, and what language would you put in there, Mr. Worthen, as a, <laughs> as a service provider? <laughs> to yeah, protect, help, I help us with that. Need, I mean, you, businesses need to protect themselves too, right? I mean, I think we all believe in the greater good, but you know, your for-profit business. Yeah, and, and I'm the business that Russ talks about where we've we've put our own funds in, we've borrowed money on our own backs, and we're borrowing money on a shorter term than utilities have access to. In fact, the PUDs up in Washington, uh, if you if you look at that, those were established uh, from a fiber standpoint and those open networks back in the BTOP days. So it was early, early on compared to other areas like in you know Fort Collins or somewhere like that. So the interesting part about this is providers in the PUD have literally put equipment in. I've got equipment in a couple of PUDs up in Washington as well and, and selling on those networks to, to my clients up there. The, the investment required to hang fiber, to extend laterals, that's a big investment. And to, you know, ask a pr private company to, to stand, stand by and watch public funds be used for that, that's tough. And the hard part is too, um, the, the utilities can actually borrow on a longer term. So you, you add that mix in. What, what's happening is at a 30,000 foot level, the market is seeing private providers cherry pick areas or look at areas with certain density. And if it's an underground area to serve residential, maybe skipped over, right? Because of the cost. And so the, the public is saying, we can't, we can't do this, but you also can't do it on the back of private investment. And then you've got equity funds coming in and you've got public companies getting, getting raked over the coals. There is no perfect mix here, right? There's, there's like, that's, that's the purpose of this topic today is how do you get into a kumbaya, sit around Russ's campfire situation and and have every Literally. party <laughs> and have every party agree on a direction because the, the other interesting part about this is management changes within government every four years eight years so any any well-intentioned public network that partners with a provider actually is at risk later on as this change happens right and so I can see the standpoint of the provider in the state of Washington have you know going to the going to the PUD and saying, I thought we had something good here, because there is that need to have a relationship and to sit around the campfire and agree that everybody has a job. Everybody it, has I guess a role. Step per, I guess take it even a step further on the different types of service providers, right? From between the service provider like yourself or Zach service providers you deal with like WISPs, right? Like get into they all have this, both of you guys have the same goal, trying to provide service, but it's a different technology, it's a different approach, and sometimes even different funding, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So <clears throat> where we've seen partnership work, you know, it's, it's wireless internet service providers who need assets, they need height, uh, they need towers, they need water towers uh, to be able to um, uh, beat physics and beat the earth, to deliver uh, point to multi-point capabilities to their rural um, <clears throat> communities. And then you've got uh, the munis municipalities or the utilities that um, will horse, um, they'll trade and they'll say, you know what, we'll give you, we won't charge you rent for that asset. You can put this on top of our uh, building. 
um, and you'll be able to deliver internet access, but <clears throat> we want transport to be able to deliver our two-way radio traffic or our SCADA data for utilities or whatever it is. So we've seen uh, cooperation there. And in just hearing Brian W. talk about <clears throat> you know, everyone and, and having responsibilities and skipping over neighborhoods and things like that, there's, um, we all have a, a responsibility and the diligence that we need to do to connect students and people that have been forced into their homes to work from home. And uh, just collaboration and cooperation is absolutely needed, especially with COVID-19. And I know we're, we're right on the brink of all getting vaccinated here, but there is still this huge uh, digital divide. And Nick, working with you and your team last year, uh, one of the sound bites or the facts that came to uh, to the forefront was America was 20th in broadband connectivity. I'm like, how can we as America be 20th with all of our technological advancements, with all of our federal funding? It's like, you got to be kidding me. There's no way that statistic is real. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess to go back to the um, probably Eric and Russ, like from a public perspective, is the model, I mean, you know, Brian went through a different couple of different versions of the public private partnerships. Do you guys think from a public perspective, like have we cracked the nut on the right, on the right model? Or are we actually still trying to figure it out? Well, I liked, <clears throat> I liked Brian's comment actually about you need to kind of understand what the makeup of the community is and kind of understand what their need is and how things can change. I think that's uh, especially from a state like Idaho, where you have a metropolitan area that has 780,000 people in it, and then you have townships and unincorporated areas and communities, especially ones that I've been working in recently that have 500 people, 200 people, you, you know, working with them on their broadband uh, plan and kind of helping them understand their need. And you have a part time mayor, you have a part time city clerk, and that's it. And they're kind of at a loss on what to do next and where to and and at a loss for time which is i think the biggest challenge for a lot you know is um you have someone that's has a deep love for that community but struggles to have the expertise to cut because they've never they haven't spent 30 years in the world of broadband and they're just kind of understanding what they're hearing from uh, community members saying listen we have a need what can you do so I think that's where uh, the key is really understanding and kind of figuring out what your assets are in the community and how you can best tailor that uh, and tailor the approach. I mean, certainly when we, so we used $50 million with the CARES Act dollars to deploy 30 and we ultimately reimbursed 38 million worth of uh, broadband grants uh, uh, projects across the state of Idaho. So around 83 projects we completed over the course of six months um, in about 100 and it's 147 communities that we touched oh. through those um, in about 30,000 households. So, but, but to Brian's point, I mean, I, I worked in Southeast Idaho on a project that, that was running fiber uh, through a town of 300 people uh, or worked on a fixed wireless solution in one of the counties that uh, in Lewis County that covered a quarter uh, of the entire population in that county through like 12 towers that they built out. And, and so to be able to kind of go to legislators in that area and say, listen, again, you need, uh, you know, some people may want, you know, fiber to the home, but listen, through this dollar, you know, this grant, we were able to kind of connect a fourth of the county to a fixed wireless option that provides them with broadband right now uh, is a monumental achievement and something to kind of, and, and so again, it's, there's, it's, it's super complex and that's, that's why we don't have an answer for it right now. I mean, if this problem was easy, it would have been solved. I guess that's, I mean, go a little bit into the, the why, right? I mean, obviously there's tons of CARES money. There's lots of, there's a lot of funding towards this. Do you think that both, and I'll put this on the public and the private side, I mean, let's maybe start with the public side. Everybody knows we need, to Zach's point, like we need to be not be 20th. And I mean, we need to be, we need to be way up there from a broadband perspective. But when the legislation meet, legislators meet and the PUCs and everybody else, like, 
do the do people actually understand the why, right? We talk about, you know, economic benefits and healthcare and education. Do you think those are, and I'm not being flippant, but I mean, do you think those are sound bites or do you really think there is an understanding of how once the broadband is in the ground or in the air of what to do with it? Do you think that the, the on the public side, they know what to do? No. 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 I mean, I, I would say there's an understanding, at least now, that broadband is a critical need. That, that's, <laughs> that been the, that, that, that's been, I think, uh, that's been the greatest uh, impact, I think, at least in, uh, for us that we've seen in terms of COVID, that at least it has made everybody aware that broadband is a critical need. Um, so that's good. But then what to do is, yeah, it's still up in the air. Yeah, listen, we got we got antiquated systems all the way around, right? If if we really knew this, the FCC wouldn't be messing around with 25.3. We wouldn't have the USDA talking 10.1. They don't have a clue. And that's how we're leading our funding. We're building infrastructure that when it's done funded, it's out of date. It's no longer useful. So if we truly knew what we were talking about, we'd be talking about building networks that we could live with in the next couple of decades. You're going to get my soapbox real quick, and then I'll get off, and I'll let everybody else talk. Because I can't. Will, your camera, will your camera <laughs> zoom out hey, enough hush. to see the soapbox? <laughs> soapbox. Hush, hush. Get on the, no, get on the soapbox. In. I'm coming in. No, I mean, here's the deal, right? We're going to see a stimulus package. It's going to happen. There's going to be an infrastructure package. When that infrastructure package comes, it's going to be loaded with broadband infrastructure. If we fund one network that my five-year-old son has to pay for in 20 years that is not around and functional and he's able to use with stimulus funds, Criminal, criminal, it is. Uh, we just, we need to quit screwing around. You know, and that's why Washington not. State's, Washington State's taking a, a, a lead on this. And uh, yeah, it's aggressive. And I know it's, it's, it's expensive, but our goal, 2028, 150 symmetrical, right? We're, to everybody, we're not screwing around up here, right? So, and, and is that attainable? I don't know, but we're gonna put that as our moonshot. And we're gonna focus on that because we wanna build networks that are gonna be around for a long time. We will be technologically agnostic in areas where we have to be, because that's where we have to think, you know, where it's going to cost, uh, you know, an arm and a leg, like we did with the whole tribe and SpaceX. But, but I'm going to tell you right now, it, we are, it is incumbent on us as leaders in this industry to continue to work on building those scalable infrastructures and not mess around with subsidizing the billions of dollars we do in 10-1, 25-3, and antiquated uh, uh, asymmetrical networks. Okay, I'm done. Russ, have you had a have you had a lot of pushback from ISPs about that 150 symmetrical in terms of a technology? Yeah, of course I of, do. Like challenge? Yeah, of course, I mean, of course we do. But uh, you know, you can't argue with the fact that we got to build. You can't argue with the fact that today. So I'm doing a broadband test to the to the premise in the state, right? I've got 45,000, 50,000 dots on my map right now. 68% of those dots are showing less than 25 megabits to the prem. On today's networks, where we have the need to do healthcare, education commerce, work, multiple works, you know, uh, precision ag, entertainment. Remember we used to use broadband for entertainment? Entertainment, <laughs> all, 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 a lot of times all, all at the same time, you know, these networks aren't built for this, right? Oh. And so we have, to, we have to continue to help that. That's the public side. Bottom line is there is no right answer. It's not public is gonna be the right answer. Pub private is gonna be the right answer. It has to be a work together. We have to come together with our providers. We have to support our providers and we have to support them with public public assets and public funds, right? So we can continue to do the good work that's going on out there. All right, I'll mute. Wow, that, that was, was awesome. Bro. That was a hell of a soapbox. Yeah, get fired <laughs> up, Russ. I like it. This is well, what yeah, I to like your point, about, though, too. This is what I like about what Eric said is Eric brings up these small communities. I've talked about this before on this, uh, on this program, uh, this entertainment program. <laughs> That we're, we're here for but <laughs> these smaller communities need a need a provider they need yeah. someone because they don't have they don't have a full-time attorney and this is something i've said before so i'm i'm really pleased to hear eric recognize this because how do you cut a deal with a community that that doesn't even understand the telecom act of 96 or understand franchise agreements or can't be paid on internet and there's been some legislatures that have been really helpful at the state level to say here, this is, we're going to reiterate that this is how you write a franchise agreement. And that helps those discussions. But as a provider, you look at those conversations and having to recreate that. We, we scan the, the horizon and say, who do we want to walk through the door with or across a threshold with 
because you have to have a champion too. This is the other part that we need to talk about. And, and this is the case for public private partnerships. You have to have a champion that not only takes across a line, but provides that continuity to the next set, set of people to keep that thing going. But to that point, so who does, who is the champion? Is a private, is a public? There's local. There's a, yeah. there's a local and there's a provider because here's the hard part. The, the PUD network that Russ described or this, the city of Ammon, uh, what they're doing is they're saying, we, we're building this for everybody and it's very transactional, which I think in a mid-sized community uh, will work, right? The smaller communities is what Eric is talking about where that just won't work. And so like the town, uh, town of Fort Morgan, Colorado, what did they do? They cut a deal with a provider and it says a provider has exclusivity for a certain amount of years. So that's an interesting model, right? The provider gets some sort of assurance that they can protect that investment because they have the time to set it up. And that's, that's the hard part about a PPP. There's, there's the time to set it up. There's meeting upon meeting upon meeting. And a provider looks at certain communities and says, this is gonna be hard. There's no local champion. We're willing to be a champion here, but we gotta hold hands. We gotta walk across this threshold together. Brian, in that Fort Morgan um, scenario, Fort Morgan is, as a city, they are owning all of the fiber though, right? I so, believe so. And I believe that's the case in Breckenridge as well. Right. So that's why, it, you know, there was, there's still obviously a major investment for the ISP to come in and, 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 and you know, be able to do what, everything they need to do to provide, you know, great service and customer service. So they need, they needed to have some assurances, right, that if they don't own those assets, that someone else is not going to be able to come in here so quickly, right, and unseat us because it takes some time to obviously put the investment into the community, right? Yeah. Another aspect, too, is I think it's interesting is where you've also seen some really interesting models where um, you, you may have, you know, a portion of the fiber owned by the city, but then where some of the ISPs then fund the drops, right? So then there's kind of a, an investment, right? There's a barrier of entry, right? From competition, they've got skin in the game. Um, that's really interesting. Just curious, um, you know, uh, Russ and Eric, have, have there been some um, scenarios like that that you've seen in, in, in your states where there's kind of like this, you know, partnership where, you know, the, the Muni owns, you know, all the backbone fiber and, 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 and then the drops are being provided by somebody else, right? The actual ISP is owning that portion. Go ahead, Eric. I, I, can't, I can't think of one off the top of I my got, head. No, no, I got. I can do it, Russ. Uh, so we, I, we have a good example in our backyard. Um, it, the city of Emmett is a really good uh, example. And where what happened is that uh, years ago, and this is, I think, to also to Brian's point about the need for planning and understanding your community. Again, like we have some communities right now that are knee deep in the broadband and broadband work. And then we have others that have come forward to, to me and said, hey, I want to get involved in broadband and I need broadband right now. And I'm like, well, it's a process. Yeah. You know, again, you haven't done the legwork that maybe some of these other communities have done. And so you really don't know what you need. Uh, and so get, helping them through that process is, is important. So anyways, um, the city of Emmett years ago, and, and, you know, they have a public safety and water, you know, water department. And what they wanted to do was kind of build out their, their network. They had two providers in town. And what they did was they slowly went through and built out in town uh, dark fiber networks connecting water pumps and water stations. And so they slowly, slowly built out this network. They didn't go out to raise any capital to do it. They just bootstrapped the whole thing. And they, they were clever. Uh, we have small grants for rural communities in Idaho. And so every time uh, they would be doing some uh, infrastructure build out and they would ask us for grant dollars, uh, to help with maybe laying water infrastructure, uh, they would then be laying fiber at the same time. So they are super, super clever and had a really strong plan about what they wanted to do. And so uh, in, in doing that build out, they've now uh, gone to six providers. They, they just, this past uh, fall, were working with a developer uh, and an ISP to kind of build out all the drops to all those homes. But we're able to do so at an affordable price because the ISP was able to use that backbone uh, the, the dark fiber backbone to build that out and then carry the rest of the way over to the new subdivision that was being built and connect to all the homes. So 
it's and I think that's you know again another example of just a really understanding what your community looks like and kind of um, adapting it to kind of what you have and figuring out what the best uh, solution is and so it's worked really well for them. I have to laugh. I think the there's a partnership going on with uh, Russ getting himself another beer right now. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the you five-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a private-private partnerships. What yeah, that's right. called? <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, private-private. The funny thing is, uh, I've got a senator that's begging for my attention right now, and I said, "I'm busy. I, I don't have any time for you today." <laughs> I put him off for you guys. That's awesome. Nice. That's awesome. that's nice, Russ. That's yeah. that's commitment. Yeah, just don't let this get out. Don't let this hit the internet. Really. This won't okay. be on Spotify or Apple or anything. Don't. No, it's fine. <laughs> hey, Russ. Russ, I've got a quick question for you, man. You're yeah. very passionate about uh, speeds and connectivity and, and what throughput is totally necessary. In your mind's eye, is it gig for everybody or what is that speed threshold uh, that you, you feel is necessary? You know, great question, Zach. And I, and I don't have a definitive answer for you. The reason being is I don't know that we know what we need, right? I think technology is going to dictate you know, as we gain speed on our internet, we gain application, right? And I think application will drive speed. I think what I want to try to do is build networks that are prepared for whatever it is we want to do down the road, right? So, yeah. so what I need today, I could probably 25 megs be great. If I knew I had 25 megs dedicated and they weren't going to go to 10 and six and five and, you know, and get all screwed up in, in between. I, I think we could work with that. But the problem is right now, we all know, it, past CLEC owner, over subscription model that's where we made a little bit of money back in the day it's a different ball game today and so we do need better throughput i i'm pushing i i think why i like fiber why i like fiber is it's undefined as far as how big it can go it's 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 only constrained by the the hardware we put on the ends of it right so yeah i just think that's the kind of network that we want to aspire to build right but but let's be let's be realistic you know and let's let's make sure we're not Blowing the piggy bank up, the whole tribe was a $15 million fiber bill for 36 homes. Probably a tough shot right now, right? We were able to get SpaceX in there, get them 100 megabit. All, all the whole tribe members are hooked up with 100 megabit uh, connectivity with the, with the SpaceX Starlink project. It's good, sure. it's good spend. It's a good spend for right now. Does that mean they don't need fiber? No, I think it means we still continue to try to get it out there, but we'll get it there when we have time and when we got, when we got the resources and can make other demands for it. Well, I think it's like always in my mind, always been, you know, the balance, right, of, of strategically trying to place the fiber in the right areas as that backbone, whatever you want to call it. And, and you know, we're, 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 we're seeing some amazing things done with, you know, and Brian has a ton of experience with this, Zach as well, you know, uh, with this, you know, kind of a hybrid play, right? And strategically building out your backbone, bringing fiber to, you know, um, cell sites, towers, whatever it is. And, and of course, every, every, along the fiber route, everyone's getting fiber, but then, you know, you're, you're also leveraging, you know, wireless. We're, we're working, you know, with, with a tribe in Colorado with, with Zach's uh, team and, and, you know, the capabilities of, of, you know, licensed 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, you know, is absolutely amazing, right? And, 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 and what we're designing right now for this particular area that has a thousand square miles, you know, for coverage, um, it, it would cost a hundred million dollars to build this network out, but strategically putting fiber in the most dense areas, right? And connecting those, tiber, those towers is just a, a fabulous stepping stone, right? But you're right, no matter what, you, you, the focus has to be continuously driving more fiber but you know, there, there's some amazing wireless assets available today. The technology in the last 36 months is, is phenomenal what, what's happened, right? Um, and, and being able to uh, be a small carrier and to deploy your own LTE solution is, is unbelievable, right? A few years ago, that absolutely unheard of. Um, so you're, you're being able to put these tools um, in, in, in the hands of, of creative minds um, that doesn't cost a lot of money. In a lot of cases, right? So it's a it's a huge tool, and, and we're designing things let's, you know, let's, hundreds let's, of megabits. Let's uh, just, let's. Oh, go sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say. Speaking of which, just while what, what, what Brian talks about that, and I know which tribe he's talking about because I work with these guys too. I've got 20, 29 tribes up here in Washington State. Speaking of which, next beer and broadband, we should talk about RDOF and their continuous coverage of sovereign lands without any coordination or collaboration with tribal tribal reservations, right? We nope. should be talking about that. 
we just we just allocated the FCC just allocated 2.5 megahertz or gigahertz to to tribes across this country, and a month later gave their gave their real estate away in an ARDOF auction to SpaceX to to other organizations, and did not give the tribes the opportunity to self serve. And I think there's a tremendous injustice here and there needs to be a conversation. Matter of fact, I'm writing an op-ed that's gonna to go to our governor, hopefully it'll go to our, con our congressional folks and we can, get some, we can get some movement on this. I would contend park art off for a while, let these tribes go, let them, let them do their thing. Let them try to figure out what's going on. Don't, don't, don't saddle them with Viasat and SpaceX as the best technology they can have for the next 10 years. That's an injustice and it's bad, bad policy. Well, it's just well, let's, a, let's just see who the, let's let's uh, yeah. let's geek out and see who there's the Jedi Master here. Um, nod to both the Star Wars aficionados. Let's technically, though, Russ, to your point, is there really? I mean, there's the approach of you know I, we call it, you know the dark fiber approach, the lit fiber approach, the conduit approach, the these different approaches where different where the service provider owns some assets, the service provider owns assets. I, I hear what you're saying, but what model actually is, or is there a better model that says, hey, who's best to run and operate infrastructure, customer service, deployments, technical? Like, I mean, there's a lot, if, if we all want the same goal, I mean, the whole point of public-private partnerships is the same goal. Is there really, look, we're all good at certain things. Who's better to do certain functions versus just saying, well, I just because I have the money, I'm going to own it. You're setting me up for a punch, aren't you? I mean, that's, that's <laughs> the, the provider is the is the is the no-brainer on this one because they're the they're the they're the expert in, in the field. Allow yeah. them to do their core competent and let them do their work. However, that said, 90% of the cost is putting a plow in the ground. If we can offset some of that cost to allow the provider to be more more uh, more efficient at what they do, let's do it. You know, so don't don't you be doing that to me, Nick. <laughs> I uh, I would answer this a different way because I think it's a it, there's no there's no right answer, but I saw something interesting happen in my home state about ten years ago. There was one company that held the contract for the, all the state agencies and and uh, schools, and the CIO said we're going to support local providers. This company that held all these contracts was from out of state, obviously. They were public and, and it did not help the provider. Okay. So we can talk about which, which public private partnerships the best, but who do you want to partner with is the question. So you've got the provider that has been trained by uh, federal funds in the small independent territory to spread their investment out. Like it's a commercial real estate property, right? So it's all about ROI. It's not about delivering to the neighbor or you know, striving to deliver on a schedule or a timeline. It's, hey, this is the amount of people I have. This is the amount of funds I have. I don't wanna roll out too fast. I have 10 years to roll out this fun these funds under Connect America, uh, you know, ACAM, whatever. So there's, this, there's that group. There's another group that got into the ISP game. They're making a good living and they're getting a little longer in the tooth, whatever, you know, for whatever reason, they look at it like it's a lifestyle business. Okay. And then there's a third provider, which I like to classify myself as that is willing to go out, borrow funds and build and build quickly. Right. And using wireless, using fiber, using whatever tool in the chest. And then what's interesting too, about this conversation is we're talking now about a fourth provider where the municipality is our own provider. And so that's, that lends your, itself to the question you just asked. So the question then becomes who does a community want a partnership with? Right. The, the lethargic company that's all based on ROI, the, the, the gentleman that's, that's got a retirement in three years and taking cash out of the business and not really wanting to put capital in, the people that are really aggressive or, or just give up and, and just do it themselves. Hmm. Who gives a shit? Just bring me my internet is the answer. <laughs> that's true. And here's the thing too, I don't offer gig. Personally, I don't offer gig everywhere. I would love to. So the question to Russ of what's the, what's the best speed? The best speed is where you stop talking about speed. Does it work for everything you need to do, right? And that is, uh, fiber is the only thing that's going to future-proof us. We're going to have gaps. I'm in, a, I'm in a state of six people per square mile. You can't do fiber everywhere. 
right? Uh, you're going to have gaps and you can fill those with wireless and other technologies. In the end, the true answer is fiber everywhere, future proofing. It's going to create jobs on, on in locations that are having to resort to satellite. Uh, it's going to put assets in the ground, right? And we need to make changes now policy-wise so that that is forced upon new builds, new construction, open trench, co-location on utility, everything, right? It kind of begs the question then, I mean, not everywhere has a Russ and an Eric that are passionate and have a soapbox to talk about this. They have people that maybe, maybe they're just not as attuned to broadband and why it's important, right? Well, I think a lot of states don't have, you know, broadband plans, right? But, but I think the good news is you're seeing more and more um, do it right They're they're and, and this this last year has been obviously phenomenal for you know our, our, our industry um, because of the focus of you know everyone having to work from home and naturally you know the world still in, in many cases still still happening right because of this connection we have right now so I think it's brought it to the forefront and and states towns uh, you know ISPs private equity, everyone, it's like all of a sudden the light bulb went off, right? We, we've all been in this fighting this battle forever. And over the last year, it's like the light bulbs went off. So I think the good news is, you know, there's a lot of activity, but now things are getting really interesting in some aspects. And, and, and Russ brought up, you know, a huge one, right? We're, we're now starting to have government programs competing with each other. And it's like, they're not even talking to each other. Um, and it's really making you things mean government confusing. not talking to each other. <laughs> it's so... <laughs> odd that's crazy that I, would, look at that. I don't even know that how that came out of my mouth <laughs> look at the 477 report it only reports on broadband it doesn't have middle mile the only maps out there that show middle mile are private where you subscribe or the usda where they funded middle mile so how do you take a, an fcc 477 map and overlay the usda overlay a program like cap2 acam rdoc Nobody's oh, doing what I, I'd love to show you what I got. I'd love to show whoa, you. Whoa, 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 what are you doing? I'm going to no, <laughs> <I'm gonna> say, <laughs> I, I can't well, wait to show show you. Hold on, big guy. Hey, 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 uh, <laughs> um, the next one of these, we need to talk mapping. We should do it because there's a whole hour we could talk about mapping. And I and I, I agree with Brian. How ironic is it right now that all our schools and libraries are empty and our kids can't 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 connect to, to get education, right? At good intent. Unintended consequences. We as states, Wyoming did it too. We did it in Colorado. We go around, we think we're doing a great job. We go and hook up all of our schools and libraries. We get them on these big state networks. We hand out these fat contracts to these providers, multi-year contracts, and we have no obligation to have them serve around. So how ironic is it right now, these last nine months, every one of these providers are getting paid fat checks. Nobody's riding the infrastructure. Right, and the kids can't connect. We, it's Washington State's going to put. I'm trying to push a policy forward called Anchor Plus One. I think Shelby's calling it two and through. But I think what we ought to do is make certain that every provider that wins one of those lucrative contracts also has an obligation to at least provide what they could do. I'm not saying they have to, but give us some consideration for around that anchor institution. You know, I, Tony Tony Young was the CIO in Wyoming when I was there, and Tony used to come to me and he says, Russ, we've done a great thing. We've built this, this school network out and we've, we've spent a lot of money. State spent $20, $30 million on this network and we're killing it. We're doing great work. Well, what ended up happening is, and he says to me, the reason why we're doing good work is as we build this out, we're, we're encouraging those providers to do great work in the last mile. And it wasn't happening. What was happening is they were cherry picking. They'd come in, they'd grab that big fat check, that last mile connection, they'd get their fiber in there, get it paid for, and they'd run the hell away. And there wouldn't be an obligation to serve anything beyond that. We need, to, we need to change policy. We need to encourage. I'm not saying we make, because I think that's, that's a tough, that's tough language. But I think we encourage, you know, hey, give me some plan as to what it looks like when you do build to this small town of Lost Springs, Wyoming, four people, or JM, 15 people. And when you build to the post office, you get that anchor tenant, right? How are you going to serve the folks around there? Who are you going to partner? It doesn't mean you have to do it. You can partner, partner with Visionary, partner with somebody else, but show us a plan that you're considering everybody, not just the fat, the fat client. Fair Plus, those, those, those kids can connect, man. They just got to sit in the parking lot with their mom in their car. <laughs> um, what's the problem? Yeah, <laughs> um, no problem. I'm obviously, I'm obviously being a jackass there, but um, 
are we going to see guys, you know, the acronyms that the government acronyms are all out there. There's CAF connect America fund. There's the rural digital opportunity fund. And then you've got E-rate and E-rate is focused around that, that networking, that infrastructure in the school, even one-to-one programs. And then that child goes home with that device, that tablet, and they go home to mom and dad who can't afford internet, which is exactly what you're talking about, Russ. Are we going to see the federal government kind of merge these RDOF, I think the newest acronym is C-R-R-S-A-A, and I don't even know uh, what the full acronym is. But the one thing I see that's encouraging, guys, is the government is actually going to reimburse um, uh, WISPs for actually serving uh, at the home. So they're coming up from the bottom, and they're serving from the top to provide money for, to the, uh, the WISPs. Are we, my, I guess my question, in a long, verbose way, uh, maybe I'm buzzed, is are we going to see a blending of these RDOF, CAF programs and E-rate programs come together? Let's go down that rabbit hole. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting, Zach, even like, um, I know as, a, as like a state, that's the approach we did. And, and that's, you know, and you, you kind of see this for me, I see this three-legged stool problem that you have, right? It's like you go into an area and it's like, is the issue infrastructure? Is the issue cost or is the issue devices? And, you know, I was just looking, for, uh, just this afternoon, I was looking at a, a winery uh, location. They were having poor broadband. And I looked at tough one of the providers. Survey. What? That was a tough site survey. Oh, it's, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's awful. I mean, the companies I have to work with, it's, uh, yeah. anyways, but their option was uh, to get the, for broadband, uh, actually, they couldn't even get broadband speeds uh, defined by the FCC. It was uh, 24 was the 20, 20 down, four up, but that was 160 a month. And, and we've certainly experienced this too with legislators, which is a blessing in disguise who only can get access to satellite. And they're like, well, we had, we're on all these Zoom calls. <clears throat> and so I now have a $300 a month internet bill. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and for people making 35,000 a year, you know, maybe their household's making 42, maybe 45, maybe we're lucky in some of these rural areas you know a $300 internet bill a $60 a $60 internet bill is quite a bit of money so mortgage payment yeah that's a that's a huge it's a huge issue so I was really happy like this year so in addition to kind of like carving out dollars for infrastructure we also carved out money for devices using CARES Act dollars and then using money to also cover and defray some of the costs of internet subscriptions so we went and bought devices for all the students. So all the school districts submitted uh, to the Department of Ed and said, this is how many students in our area don't have devices. Uh, let's buy some. So they went out and bought a whole bunch and sent them all the students. And, and so it, I, I think your point is right on. You, we have to start working on these approaches. And it, it was, um, I got this story from an ISP and there was a, there was a, a family in, in North Idaho and they were struggling because the kids at home, the only thing, so one, they didn't have internet. So they didn't have broadband at all. And then two, they were trying to do schoolwork and the only device they had at home was the mom's cell phone number or cell phone. That was it. And it's like, how are, I mean, how are these kids supposed to even stay you know, stay, keep, keep in touching distance with their other students, let, you know, let alone like try not to fall too far behind. And, and so that, that's a huge, that's a huge issue because you, you figure, you know, and we, I, I, I am not alone. I, I talked to, you know, it's like we have other counties that um, where I talked to a county commissioner and they're like, we're seeing students all over the place that don't have access to internet and how are we supposed to learn? And, and they don't, they don't have anything to connect with. So. It's a huge, it's a huge challenge that needs to be addressed. I guess you think about it, that, that we really do focus on public private partnerships as truly the infrastructure, the delivery, the maintenance, we don't really, it really needs to take it to that next level of Zach, what you're saying, like it's, and Eric, like the, all the way to the home, right? It's not just that. How do you both from education, marketing, selling, like, edu- like, informing like all the pieces of the pie not just you know where the money is so much focused on just the build and you know if they build it they will come kind of model well 
that doesn't always solve the problem, right? No, you've got to be out there. I mean, for these models to work, I mean, you still got to do the basics, right? You need to be out there educating the community. If you, you are able to obviously make, you know, a new broadband infrastructure project happen, it's all the, the, the model works obviously with high penetration, right? So you've got to be out there educating the community that you're coming into the community, what you can do with this service. I mean, it's, it, it, it really requires, especially when it's fiber, high touch, right? You need to be coming at them in every single angle to really help them understand what is happening. Because unfortunately, these folks have been living in, in a you know, very disadvantaged you know, aspect for a long time, and they don't know. So we've got to, we've got to still continue to do the basics, right? So great, we've got, you know, if we can coordinate with all this federal funding and state and somehow it, it aligns properly, which right now it's a disaster. Um, but if all that happens, we build the network. Well, we got to get them on the network now. Whether the Muni owns it, the ISP owns it, they're together. We can't, we can't, we got to remember the basics of still educating the community to what we actually now can do. There's plenty of networks that have been built that in the, especially the early days of the municipalities that were absolute failures because they didn't know how to go out and market and educate folks and, you know, make the connection for the transaction to happen, you know, with, with, with the homeowner or the business owner. So let's hit one more topic uh, before we uh, wrap. So we obviously all agree there's, this is a need, the public private partnership. What are the risks though? You know, what are the risks? You know, we can't, uh, we'd be negligent if we didn't think about both sides of it, both from a service provider and, you know, we're all taxpayers, right? We're, we are all that money that's being doled out. It's our money. We're, we're being, it's government money, local money, state money. So what are the risks that- I think if you look at the community nets list of where there's public partnerships and the number of actual communities in the United States, we're just in this, testing phase like everybody's dipping their toe in the water and figuring out if they can work with each other and whatnot and there's actually an inherent distrust towards private <laughs> enterprise right because because everybody's a fat cat and the how do you bring that group together is the question right like how do you get them talking because i can tell you this engineers have been building network and i, I tell my folks this all the time we can build network till we're blue in the face but to hollister's point you got to actually go promote it. And what's interesting now is just in the last year and a half, I've seen the value. And I, I, uh, there's, there's a couple other CEOs that I've talked to recently of smaller, you know, smaller builders like myself. And we're all seeing the value of having a public relations person on staff. That's not a skill that a provider needed two years ago. And, and it, so how do you bring those groups together? Because everybody's just dipping their toes in the water right now. That's my, that's my observation. If, if to add to Brian's point, sorry, go ahead, Russ. No, no, go. No, you're adding to his point. I was no. just he's, he's reaching I, for a beer, is what he's yeah. doing. He's not, he's not trying to get a point. <laughs> I, I was, I was gonna, uh, I was just gonna reinforce Brian's point, and and uh, this is the economic developer in me, but I tell every single business that I talk to if you don't, if you're not contracting with a public relations firm or you don't have someone doing public relations work, uh, you're not going to be that successful, especially in rural communities because they want to know who you are. They're not, they're not just going to sign the check and say, great, go do your work and never see from you again. They want to have a relationship that's long-term and they want to understand what, like, again, that relationship, how you are going to work together to better the community long-term. I think that's a huge point. I mean, even, even for, you know, Bonfire for us, as we've developed, continue to develop relationships with folks like yourselves. I mean, it's been an absolute game changer um, for our business and learning, you know, the types of value that we can share from the learnings of working with you guys and, and others. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's vital. Um, it's been a major pivoting point for us. And um, I find myself spending as much time as I possibly can working with, you know, folks like yourselves. So it's been awesome. But, you know, so many years ago, there weren't, you guys didn't exist, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this is, this is a huge value that states are now starting to see, you know, and, and employing a broadband plan and, 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 and focusing on it. So, um, it's positive. So, how did, I guess, part of that, the risk piece, so how, did, how does the little guy, like, I, to go back to Zach for a second, like, what about the small guys, the WISPs that are wanting to actually work with the states and the local municipalities are they well, I out? think do they need a PR person 
Well, in some ways, I mean, I think Brian, you know, Worthen hit it, you know, the nail on the head. There's, there's, there's folks out there that, you know, are doing a lifestyle business and get to a certain point where, you know, they're comfortable and it's okay. Um, you've really got to figure out ultimately what your goals are. And, and so that's why we got to be careful to make sure we don't stymie any competition. You know, I, I, you know, with what Russ was talking about earlier, you know, I think that's something that's really interesting, which I love on one side of the coin where the municipality is like, you know, screw this, we need to make it happen. You know, let's do this thing. Um, I, I, I love that. But I really worry about, you know, being then crushing, you know, the small guy that may be, you know, may, ha may have such an opportunity, but immediately is smoked. Right. It's, in it's interesting, Brian. Like, so I have a, I have a, a small wisp in, in a rural community and the, the CEO of the company, I mean, the, I don't know when they sleep. So maybe that's, that's part of it. Right. You, you, the, if you're going to do this, you can't sleep at all. Uh, you just have to work true. all the time. And, uh, right. This is why That's you part lose of owning hair. your own business. Is, I mean, right. It's not, um, but you know, he's on, he's part of the economic development, the local economic development council. He, you know, he's heavily involved. He talks to all the legislators, talks to the senators in the area. So, I mean, to, I guess to add a caveat to my point earlier, it's like, you don't necessarily have to pay someone to do it. If you as a owner of a business or you have someone on staff um, and, and they have, two, three people and they, or, you know, it's the primary core and then they, you know, hire contractors to do a whole bunch of work. And it, it's not, I mean, it's not a huge business. It's a very small, you know, business, very new bootstrappy, uh, and, but they've been very successful because I think to, and this is to Brian's point earlier about being aggressive, being willing to kind of make the, being, get out there and make the investment and commit and show the, to these communities, especially that you're willing to commit and work hard for them. Um, especially in areas where they haven't seen investment for a long time to actually see something happen is a huge deal. Um, That's your even risk, if, Eric. There, therein lies the risk that Nick was yes. talking about. Yes. These providers like Brian and others are willing to get out over their skis and invest a little bit more to get into regions to help people out because they're there to help the people in the region, to help the people, their neighbors, their friends, those folks in those rural areas, in those areas where they live and work and play, right? Yeah. The risk is you start to you start to compete with that with with taxpayer dollars. You kill that 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 incentive for those folks to go out there. I've got a <clears throat> I have a rule provider that's out here. He'll, he's willing to throw six seven thousand bucks a pass to build fiber to a home. If tomorrow we said PUD you can have retail and he, the retail start going right, I I kill that guy. I would kill him tomorrow. So there's your risk. Your risk is you're going to kill the incentive to the providers that are actually doing the good work in the rural areas. And I'll say one last thing and I'll, I'll be done. But one thing we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about right now too is the big, the big, the big hairy audacious gorilla. That's digital equity inclusion. So when we start to talk about uh, whether or not we can build it, whether or not we can advertise it, it's whether or not people can afford it. That's another big thing. We can build fiber all day long to these deep rural areas and to these reservations and to these areas where economically people are hurting but then it's going to be adoption. And are we going to be responsible also to help those folks have access to what's a vital resource for their future, right? So we have to talk about the affordability, the skills, the tools, all that kind of stuff all in the same package. So lots of, lots of, lots of things to talk about here. We've really, we, we touched on a bunch here, but uh, I, you know, that, this is cool. But the risk really, I think, in my opinion, is, is we, kill the, we kill the incentive or the entrepreneur to go out and do the good work that they're doing. Not just the incentive, the spirit. The spirit. Yes. Right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it's like we talked about a minute ago, Russ, you know, and, you know, with some of the funds now overlapping each other and, and canceling out potentially even initiatives, right? That took years to build momentum. So it's like, it's scary in some aspects, right? Where you're like, it, it takes a village, of course, to, to make some of this happen. And, and then now we have competing programs, you know, at the federal level that aren't talking to each other. And then folks like yourselves are, are much closer to your communities and knowing really what you need. And then now, you know, art off and other things are stopping that. So there's, there's risk all over the place, Nick. I mean, it's, it's risk of investment. It's risk of thinking, you know, you've got a partner one day and next thing you know, you've got a competitor. There's, there's, there's a lot of risk, right? And, and so, um, I mean, it, the, the beautiful thing is everyone needs this and that's why we're all in this business, um, but there's still a lot of risk out there to be considered. I think there's a, there's a physics risk as well, gentlemen, because 
when you look at a program like Ardoff, it's different than CAF because in Ardoff, he or she who can bring gigabit will win. Everybody else has been eliminated. So 25, three, 25, one, whatever it is, forget it. If there's a gigabit provider there, great. And, and to Brian W's point, it's um, a tier one carrier may not have the same uh, spirit or grassroots. I'm gonna pick my community up and I'm gonna deliver this uh, internet access to them. They may not have the chops uh, to bid on an ARDA fund. And physics wise, they may have all sorts of foliage or, or no rights of way as far as construction to bring fiber to the home. And those that can bring gigabit or a satellite that can come in and deliver a, a, a better service than they can, they're gonna be eliminated. And then also to Russ, excellent point, brother. Um, what happens when the CRR SAA, and I still don't know all the words that are involved in that acronym. Uh, what happens when that funding runs out from the bottom up? So the residential homeowner gets that rebate uh, that the WISP can recognize. What happens happens when that runs out and mom and dad can't afford 75 to to $100 per month? Uh, and yeah. then that child, God forbid COVID lasts more or uh, the next pandemic happens. The child is forced home they have to do their work from home. What happens to mom and dad when they can't afford 75 bucks per month right. for whatever service level? Um, you know, so lots and lots of challenges. So Nick, uh, 15 more beer and broadbands, I think. <laughs> we, got a lot of, we got a lot of shit to talk about. A lot, of, a lot of shit to work out. <laughs> this was actually like a brainstorming session. That's what it You're was. Not. We just established a bunch of bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, I, it has been, uh, the time has flown, but let's, uh, it is now time for kind of the parting thoughts. So I guess my parting question, you know, for all of you to answer is, you know, and for the gentleman on the on the public side, what would you tell the private people? And for the people on the private side, what would you tell the public people? And then we'll call it a wrap. I think um, the Beatles said it best. Come together. Come yeah. together right now. <laughs> Over this should be our departing song, Nick. <laughs> I know, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> But really, that, that's really what it boils down to. What is the overall mission? What are we trying to accomplish? Um, we all recognize we have to be connected to learn, to run our businesses, uh, to stay connected via telehealth because we're telling people to stay away from the hospitals unless this is happening. So how do you still care for those people who might have a numb left arm who might be having a heart attack, but not COVID symptoms. You're telling those people, stay away. And in order for you to do telehealth or prescribed medicine or whatever, you need fricking connectivity. And so we got to come together. We got to solve this. I don't know if it's public or private or whatever it is, but the, the bottom line is America cannot be 20th and broadband connectivity with all of the resources we have available, all of the technological advancements, it's it's come together and get it done. Love it. Lots. Mr. Worthen. Yeah, it's obviously this pandemic is, has uh, had us rethink networks like DSL. That's uh, Those have obviously gone the way of the dodo. Um, but the, the trend in the last few months is actually rural migration from cities because they can seek healthcare more readily and it's more available in rural America. And I think that's going to drive more public private partnership discussion. Why is this not solved for right in, in, in these gap areas, but the most compelling part of this is every network is a public private partnership. If I don't go into community and build a relationship with the utilities folks, with the city, with the county, I'm failing. And th that needs to be a relationship where I can drop in and say, how are we doing? How are my guys doing con you know, construction wise? It, you can't have a community frustrated. The next step is picking, if, if you find someone good to partner with, bet on that partner, right? Like don't keep spending money with the, the, the person, the community that's not doing good. For so that, that that's just a compilation of my thoughts, but I, I think I think Zach's taken my position best as far as 
<laughs> come, together, come together, find good relationships, establish those, foster those. Awesome. Way to go, B Dubs. Thank you. All right, our public gentleman. Um, <clears throat> so I'll build off a little bit on Brian's point uh, again because I'm agreeing a lot with what Brian's saying, so it's uh, fantastic. But I, I think we're at this sort of inflection point with rural America, um, as Brian said, and we're seeing this in Idaho, certainly. I mean, it seems, uh, I think we're the fat, one of the fastest, we're either one or two of the fastest growing states in the country. I mean, it's, um, we saw our jobs, I think, last year increase, uh, us in Utah. So, I mean, it's, things are, economically are very different and every community I talk to large and small is seeing increase in people move to. Um, but I think in what I've seen, you know, prior to COVID, the challenges that we had was that a lot of these communities were shrinking. You know, they, they weren't seeing investment. They, they weren't seeing these opportunities. And so the challenge now is to kind of, the ring is, is being dangled in front of you. And now the opportunity for a lot of these rural communities is to grab it and you need broadband to do it because if you don't, you're going to be further behind. Um, you're not going to, you know, your students, you know, your families who have kids aren't going to move there. Uh, you're, you know, business opportunities where they can work remotely, which we're certainly seeing a lot of um, from all over the country who want to, you know, if you don't have you know, 25, three, I mean, you're okay. That's great. But if you don't have even a hundred megabytes down, forget it. Um, and so for a lot of these communities there, this is a challenging moment because, you know, for me, I want to help all my rural communities. Um, and, and if they don't have a plan yet, if, if, you know, uh, so I guess my parting word is if you're a rural community, you don't have a broadband plan yet there's a point now where you need to get on it and need to start working on it right now. Now is the time. Love it. All right. He gets into, he gets close oh into boy. the camera. Oh, oh boy. boy. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, uh, uh, hey, hey, a very wise and good friend of mine once said, when you make the mission, the loudest voice in the room, everybody wins. What is the mission here, folks? The mission is to get everybody connected, make certain they can compete and, and survive and thrive in tomorrow's economy and today's economy. If we make that our mission and not our selfish needs, we will all succeed. And if that mission includes that we partner with people that share that mission and vision, we will all kill this objective, all right? So I think I'm, I'm in line with everybody, that, what everybody just said here, which is weird because I don't ever agree with Worthen. But I'm, gonna, but I'm gonna give it to Zach, more than just stole it from Zach. We need to come together. We need to partnership with the people that believe that the mission is the, the, the loudest voice in the room. And if we can do that, we're gonna have success. Get the selfish interest out of there. Awesome. Nice. And for our parting, uh, our parting uh, word, I'll throw it to our host, uh, Mr. Hollister to close us out. Um, gosh, I mean, that, that's huge. I mean, when I was thinking about everyone's comments, it's just like, make it happen, make it happen, right? I mean, if, if, if broadband is not at the very forefront of the discussion, every one of these small towns and communities, make it happen. It needs to be at the absolute forefront of everything you're thinking about trying to do for your community. And, and come together is, I love that. I mean, because there is no right or, or wrong or, or perfect, I guess, you know, opportunity of, 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 of a cookie cutter approach here. It's, it's come together, figure it out. Municipalities need to figure out where, when they can of how to do, you know, long-term debt, right? To be able to pay these off over a longer period of time and focus on investments where an ISP is never going to be able to get that done, right? Middle mile, getting the network to the city, um, that's a huge aspect of it. You're seeing private equity finally come in to this market and, and think differently, right? It's not a VC, it's not a short-term, it's long-term plays. Wow, wait, we have the opportunity to come in here and build infrastructure like a utility and see a reoccurring revenue stream forever? You know, it's happening, right? So, so come together, figure it out. And it needs to be at the forefront of the conversations. And, and like Russ said, Quit messing around with 10-1, 25-3.
I mean, what the hell, <laughs> you know, why are we even talking about that? Uh, it's, 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 it's stupid. Um, 25, three right now. I mean, yeah, I might be able to, you know, have a couple streams going or this or that, but today when people are working from home, I've got two kids, a wife here, everyone's streaming at the same time and all hell breaks out when, when someone doesn't, when they lose their connection. And I don't care if it's the eight year old, you know, the 11 year old, or I'm not going to mention our ages, but you know, it, it, it's, it's like, come on, why are we still continuing to have this conversation of trying to motivate, you know, America to figure this out? The good news though, is we're trying to figure it out. More and more people now are at the forefront of this. And I think it's, it's incredibly exciting time for us, right? But let's make sure we drive the right partnerships. And when you find someone to work with and it makes sense, do it. Quit screwing around, make it happen. You know, it's like someone said to me one day, it's all about making a decision. And if you screw it up, so what? Fix it, but make a decision. Yeah. It's all good, right? We've all learned from our best screw ups. It defines the character of how we come out of them, right? Make it happen. And with that, a, a beer and broadband toast to coming together. Oh my God, I'm totally empty, but I'll toast. Oh. <laughs> Come together. Here's a drop. I got a 64th of an ounce out of that. <laughs> I was expecting this is exactly like Washington, right? Because this is still work hours up here. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do this next one where Russ is at. I mean, there's this concierge of concierge <laughs> coming in. I, don't know, I know. It's really nice. I don't is know it, what to do. It just keeps going. Is that the five year old, Russ? <laughs> <laughs> it's my dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks everybody for coming together for this episode of Beer and Broadway. Band. We thank our host, Bonfire Engineering and Construction, and we will see you on our next episode. You can catch us on Spotify, Apple, Google, and wherever you want to watch video on YouTube. Thank you. Just not in Washington. With a broadband connection. Yeah. Oh, Cheers. Yeah.